Hello, so uh, my name is Matej David. I'm a postdoc here at OICR. I work with uh, Jared Simpson and um, I've done some prior work on uh, read mappers. Like I wrote this read mapper called Shrimp for uh, solid data, uh, which is now kind of gone. And these days I'm working on um, like the novel assembly, um, combining long read technologies with like regular Illumina technologies. Um, and okay, that's me. Okay, so uh, in this module, we're going to uh, talk about reference genome assembly and um, some objectives. Uh, I'm going to try to explain the, the reference genome alignment, how it works. Uh, I'll, I'll spend some time talking about uh, Illumina technology, sequencing technology, and um, in particular about the types of errors that you will see in this uh, uh, with this data and like how those errors affect uh, uh, mapping and like the results that you're gonna get out of uh, um, out of uh, this analysis. Uh, we're gonna learn some uh, alignment technology and we'll see uh, this regular. Uh, file formats like FASTQ and SAM and BAM. We're just going to have we'll have a look at those in the uh, lab. Uh, and we'll actually run an aligner. Like in the lab, we actually have two aligners set up, so you can run both of them. Um, the lecture is two hours. Sorry, the lecture. The, the, the module is assigned two hours, so I'm hoping to finish the lecture in I don't know, 45 minutes, and then we'll just do lab. <coughs> Okay, so this is the outline, what we're going to do, and let's start at the top. So we'll talk about Illumina sequencing. Okay, there's uh, lots of sequencing uh, um, platforms out there. Um, some are trying to address like high throughput things, so they produce lots of gigabases per run. Others are uh, trying to produce longer and longer reads. And this slide, I think it's from, oh, it's, it's year 2014, so it is a bit out of date. In particular, Oxford Nanopore, which is this new technology, is not here. Um, however, so in, in our module, we're just going to be focusing on Illumina data, which is one specific type of data. So I'm not going to be talking about other things like Pacific Biosciences and whatever. Okay, so let's just want to talk about the uh, uh, Illumina sequencing processing first. Uh, just one uh, caution or not, whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm, my background is in computational, computer science and mathematics, so I don't really know biology. So I'm guessing there are people like in this room who know more biology than I, I do. I, I just learned whatever I need as I, as I went. Through. So um, that's that aside. Uh, okay, so Illumina sequencing. So starting with the genomic DNA here at the top, uh, how does it work? So first, uh, the genomic DNA is uh, shared into small uh, pieces, about 200 to 300, 600 BP fragments. Uh, adapter sequencing or adapters are attached to, to the end of these pieces, like the ends are repaired, the adapters are attached. These sequences are applied to a, a flow cell. Uh, on this flow cell, every single one of these species is amplified into a cluster of molecules, which are uh, hopefully the same, which are these ones here. And this is done uh, using a solid phase PCR. And then this flow cell is placed in, it's like fed into the machine, which goes on and reads. The, uh, the, the various molecules in, in the clusters using an, uh, so this is done in Illumina, it's done using uh, um, photography, basically. Um, so, uh, in more detail, so consider like this being the, um, here is the molecule which is being sequenced. So the way the, uh, uh, 
this process works is that various uh, bases over here, there's this T, are attached to an existing sequence. So this is the existing sequence uh, which we are sequencing, the ACGA here. So in cycles, in every cycle, one base is attached to this thing, which is complementary to the one uh, uh, to the, uh, in this molecule. And the bases that we're attaching, they have like a, a fluorescent dye on it. And a laser is shone on, the, uh, on all of these things. And all these clusters pr produce like small dots of color. And this is what the machine sees. So like in the first cycle, the machine sees a blue light corresponding to this to the molecule that we're sequencing here. So this is this blue thing. In the second cycle, it sees a G, which is this green, which is this color over here, and so on. And the process repeats. Uh, this is the image, like the, the actual molecule is attached to the flow cell at the bottoms, and the sequencing starts here at the top, and it goes down in, uh, in Illumina. And just one thing to point out is that it's the, the process is repeating for about 100 to 250, 300 cycles. So starting here at the top, uh, one of these Illumina reads will contain maybe 100 or 200 bases going down. This molecule could be a bit longer. It could be 600, 500. So it's, you, you want to read the entire molecule in one arm. Okay. Um, the process of base calling, so this is, uh, this is hidden from you. This is done by the machine. Um, the machine sees this kind of a picture. Uh, it is massively parallel, so it does it's, uh, the cycle supply to all these clusters. In parallel, it's, uh, the machine sees these kind of dots, colored dots, and out of these colored dots, the machine tries to make sense, saying that, OK, in this cluster, at this cycle, there was a light which looked kind of green. And in that case, we're going to put a base representing G over there. Okay, so that's, that's the process by, by which uh, uh, the machines translate this thing into, into base calls. Okay, uh, why am I telling you this? Mainly um, in order to describe the types of errors that you will uh, C with uh, Illumina data in particular. Okay, so uh, here in uh, figure A, you have a cluster. So these are identical molecules are PCR amplified, and the sequencing here is going just fine. So all the um, all the three molecules uh, are at the same kind of stage, right? So we are all of them are reading the fourth base from the top, and all the um, the molecules attached, they're all shining this red light. So then the sequencer sees a solid red light coming out of this cluster. And then it's able to call that base with certainty as being the red, uh, the base which is corresponding, but, uh, corresponding to red. Uh, the various types of errors are like some of them. Um, first of all, so in, in this slide B, you have uh, phasing errors. So you have even though the molecules are the same, the sequencing process is just got out of phase. So here, this uh, on this molecule, the, we're reading the fourth base, which is this red. But on this one on the left, for some reason, the the cycling the the cycle process skipped this base, and now the light that's shining from here is this blue, which corresponds to the next base. Over here, this the, again, the cycle, uh, for some reason, stayed behind. So this is shining a green uh, light. So at this point, because of this kind of uncertainty, uh, the light which is emitted from this, so, so all of these are emitting like one light corresponding to one of those dots. The light coming from that dot will be kind of ambiguous. So the sequencer will make some kind of guess as to what base is there. and. It will, in this case, it will probably say, well, I'm not so sure. Maybe this is a G, but I'm going to assign it like a high probability of being wrong just because of the, the light is not clear. Right? Uh, another uh, 
type of error is just like loss of signal, so maybe the molecule just disintegrated or something happened. So in this particular uh, cluster, the intensity that's coming out of there is not as uh, high as, uh, as the sequencer would expect. So again, that might confuse the sequencer into thinking it's error. And finally, like the, even if they're in cycle, uh, there could be errors with like the um, uh, floor for process. So it, it, the the the, um, the light that's being emitted might still be somehow misread by the uh, sequencer. Yeah. But it's just random occurrences. What do you mean? Like, uh, like how do these things come about? Are they just part of the sequencing process? And yeah. So the, the, they're expecting, right? So. The sequencing contains many of these slides. So, right, this is just one cluster which corresponds to one of those dots on that slide. So the machine is reading many, many of those things at the same time. Right? It takes pictures, and then there's some software that goes, says, OK, and this dot, there's a red at this time, and then a blue. Is, and hopefully, it's working OK for most of them. But these are the types of errors that you're going to see. Like it's, yeah, you cannot control like this. This will occur just by yeah, chance. Um, okay, so uh, part of the point here is that Illumina sequencing contains mainly um, uh, substitution errors uh, as opposed to like long insertion or deletion errors, which is the case with other technologies. And the base calling process, uh, it produces not only just, not only the base which is being read, like the color, but it also produces error estimates for that color, which have to do with the intensity and how much differentiation between, between the colors that the uh, sequencer is able to see. Uh, okay, so this is what the error, error rates per base position, so base position at the bottom, this is error rate, this is what they look like for some uh, um, Illumina uh, sequencing uh, um, projects. The various lines are, so these are uh, different organisms, and this is slide is taken from some assemb assemblaton uh, paper. Um, I think I think the light blue is human data, and these others, they're like various other organisms. Uh, the message here is that the error increases as you progress down in the read. So this is 100 bases into the read. So 150 is over here. So at the beginning, uh, the process is quite accurate. But as you might expect, as you go down, like in these cycles, where like you're expecting to have all those molecules uh, go through the cycles in, like in, in sync, and <coughs> doesn't always happen that way. So, uh, so as you go down, uh, the error in the reads becomes larger and larger. But in general, it's still quite good. So right, this is 0.5%, this line over here. Right? This is 1%. So the per base error rate stays well below that thing. And in general, for, for Illumina reads, you expect like overall it's about 0.5% is the error rate that we see. And it's mainly substitutions. Um, this is in stark contrast with other technologies like Pacific Bounce as the Oxford Nanopore, which have higher error rate and they have other types. So it's not just substituting, they have insertions, deletions, and, and so on. Okay, so that's Illumina sequencing. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is paired reads. So what are those? Uh, this is the normal um, uh, process. Uh, uh, which is performed by Illumina like these days. So the genomic is shared into these fragments. Adapters are ligated, which are uh, different for the two ends. So if there's an A1 and A2 and sequencing primers, these things are amplified on the flow cell. And then every one of those molecules, which again are up to, let's say, 500 BP, they are read twice. So once, that its uh, molecule is attached to this end, and it's read from from the uh, from this end going uh, towards the flow cell, and then in another in in some other step, the molecule is somehow it's, it's actually reversed and the cluster is regenerated and so on. 
but the same molecule ends up being read a uh, second time from the other direction. And the, the machine keeps track of all this. And, and what at the end, what you see are uh, paired reads. So you get, out of the machine, you get two reads, which are actually sequencing the same genomic fragment, which is this guy over here. And they're pointing towards each other like this. So one is from one end, the other one is from the other end. And if there are more, if the fragment is larger than twice the number of cycles, you will not end up reading the entire read, right? So there'll be something in the middle which is not. Okay, so this is, and this is what's called uh, paired end sequencing. So that's process. Uh, then there's another process called mate pair. So why would you want that? Uh, like for normal sequencing, uh, you might be able to use this kind of data. This is uh, mate pair reads are used more for, uh, let's say, assembly of um, like novel, have like a new organism. You don't have a reference. You want to assemble this read. So uh, assembly makes it's hard to do assembly with fragments which are up to 500 BP basis, just because the assembler would be confused by any repeat which is larger than that, basically. So mate pairs are one way to um, apply Illumina sequencing and obtain uh, sequencing data which is further apart than just five, 600 BP. Okay, so the way it works, uh, again, you have the genomic DNA here, and this is fragmented into larger chunks. So now you have two to five uh, kilobases, like sometimes even larger, like 40 kilobases. Um, taking, you take these fragments, there's a biotin uh, molecule attached to these ends, and the fragments are then circularized, circularized so that they look like this. And then this circular molecules are then uh, shared into fragments, again, uh, 400 to 600, which look like this. But then at this point, um, the molecules which do not have the biotin are kind of washed away. So you, you're, you're keeping only those fragments which have this biotin marker in the middle. <clears throat> okay, And then these fragments over here, they're fed into the regular sequencing over at this particular step. Okay, and then you go through this process. So what you're going to end up is, so if the original pair ad reads look like this, so you have a genome, C, a genome region which is 600 BP, and it's being sequenced uh, in this, so you have the two arrows pointing inwards, kind of. This is the regular thing. For mate pair reads, you will have uh, the arrows will be pointing the other way, so like outward, right? So remember, this the biotin thing is circularizing, so that's why. Um, so you'll have two, uh, you'll have two arrows which are pointing away from each other, and they're like much further apart than this other. So this is two to forty kilobases. Okay, so that's that's the difference between paired and and mate pairs. Okay, so if you ever encounter this kind of thing, so that you know what they are. Okay, uh, let's talk about the FASTQ format. So this is what the format in which regular like Illumina reads are stored. Um, the entries in one of these files, they look like this. So for the fragment uh, sequencing, you said, for example, the size of fragments is larger than the number of cycles, the fragment may not be fully sequenced. Yes. In the case of, um, um, uh, of mid-pair uh, mid sequencing, uh, is there any rule there? Is the number of cycles should be same or smaller and the same would be fully sequenced. No, so you never. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So the question was, uh, so I'm not sure. So how does the number of cycles yeah. relate to? Yes, yes. You said in the, in the prior hand, if the number of cycles is uh, lower than the size of a fragment, um, the fragment may not be fully sequenced. Yes. So the uh, same, so the, right, so in pair end, which is on, on this on the left side, right. So the if this 
molecule over here is 600 BP long and the number of cycles is only 150, you're going to read 150 from one end, 150 from the other, which is 300, and in the middle you have like a region of 300 BP, which is not being read, okay? The same, it's exactly the same thing applies here. Um, it's just that, yeah, the, the uh, uh, it's, so this particular fragment, the one with the biotin molecule in the middle, the same uh, statement will apply to this fragment. It's just that because of the process, you have to unwind that and put them like on the reference and see what like how much genome is in between them. Uh, so you end up with which yeah with reads that are like this. Again, you have 150 and 150 on either side, but in the middle you have like 40 kilo up to 40 kilobases. Okay. Um, FASTQ format. Okay, so in, in this uh, in FASTQ uh, files, the reads are stored. So if you look at them, we're going to look at them in the uh, lab. So you have every read is stored on four lines. This is a, a read name, which so it's called a label, which sometimes contains encodes the position where that read came from on the flow cell. Remember the the square picture with the dot, so that might be encoded in the read name. Um, this is the read sequence, ACGT, it's a comment, and this is the quality, uh, the score, the base quality values for that particular read. And this is, this is a way to encode those errors that I was talk talking about. Okay, uh, in and within this is like a bigger FASTQ file, and you can see this is one read, this is a record for another read, and then another read, and so on. So they, they're like uh, sequential within that file. That's the sequence data. The parent line is just like it starts with the Sorry, the, for, the third line. Yeah, so the third line is um, the one with a plus. So this, I, initially I thought it's a comment like a few years ago, but then I, so I think it's, it's a bit redundant, that line, and I think it comes from uh, earlier uh, uh, file formats where the read, the read basis and the base qualities were in different files, and each one had its own name. Like, so there was a label for the read and the label for the base, co base uh, qualities. And then the process of putting those together, in that process, this third line appeared. Um, but yeah, usually it's, it's either empty or it's equal to the other, to the label here. And I think many, safe to say that many tools just ignore the third line, but let's not assume that. So in this particular example, see it's the label on the first line is equal actually to the label on the third line. Um, Okay, so how are base quality scores? Um, so out of the uh, sequencing process, you have uh, pro estimates of errors that this particular uh, base call is an error. It's only a C with 15% certainty or 15% probability it's something else. Um, the way this is encoded, first of all, the probability is transformed into an integer uh, within this range and uh, I, yeah, I keep, uh, I forget to add this formula to my slides. Um, the formula is quite simple. It's something like, oh, okay. Quality is something like minus 10 times log base 10 of probability of error. So, using uh, this standard formula. So you take the probability of error and you apply this and you get like an integer um, quality value which is in this range. And then this, uh, these integers are encoded as ASCII characters within that file using two schemes. Like one is FRED plus 33 and FRED plus 64. And the reason is so that you become confused. That's why, because no, like, 
the different companies use different encoding uh, schemes, uh, obviously. However, the situation is better these days. Um, so this is uh, on the FASTQ Wikipedia page. You have this representation of what the various characters, what qualities the various characters encode. Uh, so you have here the ASCII char uh, characters starting from number 33 to 126. And so under FRED plus 33 encoding scheme, you have these characters over here are encoding the qualities between 0 and 40. Um, so for instance, if you see in the quality values, if you see numbers, ASCII numbers like 0 through 9, you see that these do not belong to this other range, which is FRED plus 64. So you know that your data is encoded as FRED plus 33. If you ever see like smaller case letters, like A, B, C, D, E, F, then that means the encoding scheme for those qualities is FRED plus 64. Because again, FRED 33 ends over here. So it, it never makes it over here. Um, these days, this is better because Illumina uh, which is the bulk sequencing, NGS sequencing, Illumina switched to FRED plus 33. So if you have like recent Illumina data, it's also encoded as FRED plus 33, just like all the other uh, sequencing uh, uh, data. In the past, if you, if you ever look at older Illumina data or download it from like some public repository, you might have uh, the quality is encoded as FRED plus 64. Okay. Uh, paired and then mate pair. So how are these encoded? Uh, usually the corresponding reads, uh, they are given to you in separate FASTQ files, which are kind of in sync. So the first, the first record in one file corresponds to one read. The first record from the second line file corresponds to the second read of the same fragment, right? And then they go in sync like this. And rarely the, the, the um, uh, reads from the same fragment are interleaved in the same file, but that's, that's not usual. And oftentimes, but not always, the read name is ending in slash one or slash two. So you might open one file and you see that all the read names and in slash one, and if you open the other file, you see that all the read names end in slash two. But that, that's not always the case. Um, okay, so let's talk about reference alignment. It's all about uh, Illumina. Uh, so what's the goal? Why do we do reference alignment? So in general, we want to find reads that come from certain uh, genomic regions of interest, like genes. So we have a reference genome, and we know where the genes are on that reference. We want to find the reads that come from a particular gene in the donor genome. Uh, so the goal, again, is to infer variations in the donor genome. Sometimes we want to uh, reconstruct the donor genome, so like to do assembly, and uh, some assemblers do uh, start by mapping the risk to the reference and then processing them from there. Uh, what are the main issues uh, with this? Well, first of all, eukaryotic genomes are uh, large and repetitive, and uh, mapping to repetitive regions is very error prone. There's large amounts of data, and then there's all these differences. So between the reference and the donor that you're <coughs> sequencing, you have SNP signals, structural variation. And furthermore, between the reference and the actual reads that you see, you have all these variation plus the sequencing errors on top of that. Okay, so there's all these things. So the, the alignment process has to allow for all these differences. Uh, the main steps, this, I'm, I'm talking here about a generic alignment process, not about any particular aligner. Um, so the, the way this works is uh, the, the aligner constructs some kind of index of the reference sequence. So it takes the reference sequence, it processes it like once, and it creates some kind of structure uh, that it uses internally. And then for each sequencing read that you give, 
it identifies regions of interest for alignment. And this is the most uh, important step and various aligners differ in how this is done. Like sometimes they, uh, some ask for exact matches of a certain minimum length or for several matches in close proximity of, a, again, of certain lengths and so on. If pairing information is available, so if you have like a read paired and or made pairs, <coughs> this information is used by, by the smart assemblers to reduce this list of uh, possible alignment locations. Um, the third step, conceptual step, is to actually align the read to that particular, to all the regions where it might go. And this is a very costly step, right? So the speed comes from reducing this list using all sorts of heuristics. And then next, various aligners have varying stopping criteria. Like some give you all the alignments for a read. Some give you just the best alignment. And it's all these uh, um, options. Um, some aligners do, again, do they secondary alignments, like maybe they split the read. If it's like you have a long read, it's 150, maybe it can report, the aligner can report a mapping of 70 BP to one location and another 80 BP to like a completely different location, that, that kind of stuff, split alignments. So, and these this kind of options differ from aligner to aligner. Um, right, this is just a, a uh, diagram of what I've said. So this is a read and this is the reference and the aligner <laughs> finds three locations like one, two, three in here and here the read aligns with one mismatch, here it aligns with two mismatches. So in, probably in this case the aligner will report that the correct mapping locations is here and it will attach a certainty like a, a, a quality value which is a certainty to this assignment. It will say this read, the mapping is correct with a certain probability. Uh, for the reads, okay, looking at the first read in the pair, let's say it maps to two locations in the genome. Both In both locations it has one of this mismatch. But then looking at the second read of the same fragment, it, the, the read is mapped in this location with very uh, with like no mismatches, but over here it has lots of mismatches. So in this case, the read aligner will probably say, okay, this is on the left is the correct mapping location for this uh, uh, for this paired reads. Uh, various properties which are relevant to aligners are so accuracy. Uh, why? Because misaligning reads to the reference, that's, that's a source of um, false positive variant calls, like down, like down the pipelines. Uh, sensitivity, you must allow for variation between reference and donor. Um, so for human, humans are like pretty, uh, the, the expected difference between a reference and the donor is quite small, but for other organisms like that, that can be much, much larger. Uh, I was working once with like some Siona, data, which is this C organism, and it has like 7% difference between two individuals is huge. So the, the more the organism, like the, the more the reference the donor uh, differ, the more you want to allow the, the aligner to be sensitive. Speed is always a factor, you have to large amounts to data to process and memory because compute nodes have limited resources. So of course, the question is which one is the best liner? I don't know. Um, the ones which we will use in this lab are BWA and Bowtie, which are good kind of established all around the liners. But there are better liners if you're looking for certain things. Like for speed, these are faster. These are more accurate sometimes. And if you're looking for special functionality, like dealing with you know RNA-seq data, and you want to uh, uh, align across uh, splice junctions, then there are separate aligners that offer those kind of options. Okay, and you can just see a recent survey for comparisons. I was gonna put one, but um, for some reason the, the page that the paper pointed to is not available anymore, so didn't put it. 
Um, okay, are we doing on time? It's 11, okay. So Sanban format. Um, so this is, uh, once you run an aligner, then you have to, the aligner, what it, what it does, it produces this kind of description of which read maps where in the reference genome. Okay, and the way this is described is uh, in this standardized SAM format, which is a tab delimited uh, text file. Uh, BAM is just a compressed binary form of that same uh, thing. And the way to uh, access both these types of files is uh, this SAM tools toolkit, which we'll use in the, in the uh, uh, lab. Uh, and this can be used yeah, to convert, sort alignments, extract alignments from a given location, and so on. Uh, this is what, uh, so this entire thing over here, this is just one line describing one mapping. This is part of one of these SAM files. Okay, so this, this is just on one line. It's not, you know, five lines over here. I just ran out of space. Um, and the main things are, so this is the read IDs over here. This is a flag, uh, which is a numerical value, and this encodes things such as the on which strand of the reference that read is mapped to, like the forward or the reverse, the pairing information for that particular read, uh, and some properties for the alignment. Like this is the main or supplementary or duplicate and so on. So these are all encoded in this integral value and we're, we're going to look at this in the lab. Next two things are, this is the chromosome. So in this particular uh, case, the read is mapped to chromosome 19 of the whatever reference. Uh, position within that chromosome. A mapping quality, again, this is a thread encoding of the probability the alignment location is wrong. So uh, this is one of the important ones. So again, uh, FRED is just this same uh, formula. So it's an encoding uh, of a probability of something being wrong as an integer. Okay, so in this case, 60, a FRED value of 60. So uh, to get the probability, you have to do the reverse of this, right? So probability of error is... Uh, what is it? So it's Q divided by minus 10 to the power of 10. So in this case, if I have a mapping quality of 60 and you apply that formula, you're going to end up with probability of error being about 10 to the minus 6. So the higher, of course, the higher the number, the better the map, the more certain the mapping. And in this case, what this the way to interpret this particular thing is that out of one million mappings that look exactly like this, you expect one of them to be wrong. Okay, that's what 60 means. Um, usually, like in different analyses, if you have a read which is mapped to a repetitive region, or you have some kind of artifacts, the mapping quality, the aligner will report a very low mapping quality. So usually when you're doing an analysis, like what you, what you, what you do is to drop all mappings which have mapping quality less than a certain threshold, like 10 or 30 or something like that. Right? So that's usually the first filtering step. This is what it means. So 30, again, 30 means one in a thousand of those mappings that you keep might be wrong. What if it's mapped well, but to two places? Yes, so, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah. So the question is what if we have a read which is perfectly mapped to two locations in the genome? 
what what do you think the aligner would do in that case? Sorry? The same gene, but it's So, uh, so, the, so no, the question is like, what would the aligner report? So, uh, you have the same read map to exactly, map perfectly to two genome locations. So, the, what it does, what the aligners will do, uh, if you're asking for the single best mapping location, which is usually the case, like sometimes you list all of them, like you want to see all of the alignments, like especially for some projects you want to, uh, uh, you might want to do that. But if you're just asking for the top of the location, the mapping, the mapper will produce either of those locations and will assign it a quality of zero. Uh, technically, um, if you think about it, the probability that the mapping produced by the aligner is wrong is exactly equal to 1 over 2 in that case. Let's say that the read comes from either of those two locations and nowhere else. So in that case, the, the record that the aligner produces is wrong with probability 1 over 2. If you apply this formula to, to 1 over 2 with probability of error 1 over 2, you're going to get like something 3 point something less than 4. So technically, probably the uh, a mapper should report a quality of three or four, but oftentimes in this kind of ambiguous cases, it just trims that down to zero. So it's completely uncertain. The mapper is completely uncertain that the alignment record that it reports is is like, it's completely uncertain about it. Yeah. Yeah. and the low probability for that mapping being correct. Um, if, you, if you are interested for chromosome X, which does have a lot of uniqueness in knowing all the positions uh, that are in the mapping, you can use, uh, you can change the parameters to actually give you that. Thank you. Okay, okay next is this uh, cigar string, which is describing, so remember we have the read and the reference. So this cigar string is uh, describing the differences between the reference and donor in this particular mapping. So in, the, in this example over here, we have 76 matches. So this read sequence is matched verbatim to 76 consecutive bases of the reference. Unfortunately, this M doesn't tell you whether the base is uh, equal or it differs from the one that is being mapped to. So M, uh, M might stand for both bases being equal and bases being different. Okay, so you can't just like look at this and say that oh, they're all equal. Um, these are some other cigar strings, like examples. This is the reference to the donor. So here you have four <laughs> matches followed by one deletion. So this is the cigar is with respect to the reference. So this base, this T over here, is deleted in the donor. And then you have another six matches. Right? In this case, you have, uh, oh, here you have like one base which is inserted, which is this T. And you can see in this case that the first four bases, they're not all equal. So the first four bases are mapped to the first four bases of the read. However, you have a difference over here between A and T, right? So, and that's not captured by the cigar string. Okay, uh, the next fields in this uh, uh, um, entry are the positions, like the mapping positions for the mate. And this is equal means it's mapped to the same chromosome. This is position of the mapping for the mate read. And this is the fragment size. So fragment size, remember, it's that uh, uh, is that fragment that we saw during the sequencing. So this might be larger than the sum of the cycles. So this could be up to 600. It depends on the, the, the way of the, the library is prepared. Okay, and then this is the read sequence, and these are the base call, uh, uh, again, qualities. So we're going to look at some of these files in the lab. 
And the last thing I want you to uh, talk about in the lecture are some sources of errors, like in this whole process. Uh, first of all, when you start with uh, sequencing reads, the, the reads that you get from the machine might be wrong in, in all sorts of ways. Okay, So you might have uh, base qualities which are lower than what you would like or what you'd expect. And those qualities could be low in certain positions in the read. Or you might have some kind of contamination on the flow cell, like maybe there's some substance over there which is interfering with the se sequencing process. Have, or you can have overall base, uh, low base qualities. You can have contamination either from other organisms or you might have contamination with adapter sequencing sequences. Uh, so these days, usually the, the adapter sequences are being removed by the, like from the data that you see, but sometimes they're not. Or maybe in the past, if you download again, if you go download like an older data set, that might have contamination with the adapter sequences that are, are used by the Illumina process. Uh, because of that, so the first thing we're going to do in the lab is we're going to inspect the input reads with some software which is called FastQC. And that produces various types of reports. And you can see some, some kind of these uh, uh, things, errors. You can, they can be captured by these things. So we're, we're going to look at those in the lab. Um, so that's about the input data. Now what about the mapping errors? So let's look at these two uh, uh, situations over here, so left and right. In both cases you have, uh, this is the, uh, the coverage, right? So this is the amount of reads mapped to a certain base in the reference. And you have a graph that looks like this on the left and here one on the right. So now the question is, what do you make, what do you think this kind of a bump, what does this mean? So that, can it possibly mean that there is a, let's say, a duplication in the reference, like maybe this region occurs twice in the reference, so then it's being sequenced more than, than the, the region around it? Uh, or can, be, can it be that case in both left and right? So I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you the answer. So the, the problem that you might see with Illumina sequencing, which is exemplified in the left, is that of uh, duplicate sequencing, du duplicate. Uh, uh, duplicate right? So um, during PCR amplification, the various molecules which are attached to the flow cell are being amplified uh, at different rates. So PCR, uh, so some molecules might be favored by PCR so that they get you get more copies of those molecules than, than others. Okay, so in this case, after mapping, if you look at all these sequences over here, so they all map to exactly the same location in the reference. Okay, so that's like a big warning sign that all of these molecules might come from the same fragment before PCR amplification. Okay, so that and that in turn means that this bump over here could be entirely artificial. So you might be seeing this bump in coverage just because the fragment at that location was uh, somehow favored by the PCR amplification. It got overrepresented, and you see too many copies of it. Yeah. I thought that there are some reason technologies that don't have the PCR step anymore, they just sequence whatever is yes. there. Yes, yes, okay. so yeah, so that depends on the library preparation. Like some steps, they do not have PCR, um, others do. So I, I'm just telling you, yeah, if you if you have PCR steps, you might have, you, you might have this kind of stuff. Um, it also, so from what I understand, it, it's, there are two types of duplicates. One are come from PCR through this process, and uh, I understand that you can still get PCR duplication because the like the way the the uh, camera is looking at the slide of dots, it might just read the same dot twice. So you get optical duplicates that come from the same region on the on the flow cell, 
So those are called optical duplicates as opposed to PCR duplicates. Those you might have all the time, no matter whether you have PCR or not. Okay, so uh, the reason for this thing, the, sorry, the, the way to deal with duplicates is to run some kind of software. In this case, we'll, we'll use Picard, which finds and marks these kind of duplicates so that you can remove them so that you get better estimate of the of the actual copy number like in your analysis downstream uh, in the alignment okay so let's look at this picture uh, at the bottom so forget the top half like look at the bottom half so uh, remember I said that uh, the primary source of errors for Illumina data are uh, substitution <coughs> errors as opposed to indels okay so that fact is um, used by the aligners when they decide how the various bases in the read are mapped to the reference. And the specific error that we're going to see in this case is that uh, uh, substitutions are much more likely to occur than the, their ins the insertions, like with Illumina bases. Um, so, okay, let's see what happens in here. Let's look at this bottom part. So you can see there are one, two, three, four, five. So there's, I don't know, about nine reads over here who's, who have the right end of that read, like in this same region, okay? And they're all clipped. Like this is, this is a visualization tool that you're going to learn about in a different module. But basically what it says is the colors are saying that those bases are not mapped to that particular location. But what's weird is that all the reads in this region that end here have the same, like, right, see, the bases are the same. Like, the colors are the same, they're aligned. The same thing happens for the reads which end in this region where the left end is in this region. So here you have one over here and then another three. Right, let's forget about this read, maybe that's erroneous. Um, so what happens here is that the, the aligner is taking each one of those reads uh, like one at a time and is trying to map it to the reference and it finds these kind of errors and it, because of the scores that it's using, it says, well, this is a substitution error and then this is another substitution error and so on. Okay? One thing to keep in mind is that the aligners the aligners are always processing one read at a time and then per perhaps using with its mate pair, but then they never look at two different reads. Okay, so the aligners take one read, do it, process it, map it, take another read, process it, map it, and so on. So that's why the aligner never sees this kind of bigger picture that you see here. Okay, so what happened in this particular case, you can see this read is like right in the middle over in, in here. So you have a read which is mapped over here and then this is a big deletion and then the read continues over here, right? So what happened in here is that you actually have a, a bigger deletion in the donor with respect to the reference, okay? And because of the scoring theme and the underlying assumptions about Illumina data, the aligner is prefers to map all these reads with substitutions rather than uh, deducting that there's like a large you know, in, uh, deletion like that. Okay, so uh, again, this, this type of situation can lead to errors, like variant call, variant call errors downstream. So um, it's one of the things that we clean up uh, uh, at, at, like at the right after mapping. This is another example of the same, it's exactly the same thing. You have reads which end, whose left end is here. They have one error and then reads with the right end over here, they have a different error. And then if you realign them, you observe that this is all resolved by just calling like one deletion over here, okay? Um, the software which does that, which we're gonna use is called GATK, it's like a standard tool. And that software, it will be able to, <clears throat> it's able to look at all the reads mapped to a certain region of the reference and realign them locally. So again, so this is something that the aligner never sees. The aligner only sees one read at a time, so it's never able to 
to do this kind of inference. Okay, and then the last thing is novel sequence, and this is the hardest kind of to deal with. So when you have a, a reference genome and a donor, most of the donor reads will map somewhere in the reference, okay? But you will always have regions in the donor which are completely not represented in the reference. Like, they're just not there, just because, because of differences, or maybe the reference is wrong. So, for that reason, you might have, like in this image, let's take this example, we are, this, see this red dot over here, the red bar, that signifies that the region we're looking at is right next to a centromere in chromosome 2. In this case, this is chromosome 2. So it's next to the centromere of chromosome 2, and you have this kind of uh, um, coverage map, right? So this every line here is a read map to this region. And you have these bumps, and over here you have some really huge bumps, and so on. So what's happening here is that uh, most probably the donor and the reference, they differ in the number of copies of some of those really repetitive regions next to the centromeres, right? So maybe the, um, maybe the donor has more copies, and the, what happens if, if you have that? You have more reads coming from those regions, and then the aligner will try to force those reads to be mapped somewhere in the reference, but it doesn't have that many uh, um, possibilities, so then it ends up creating these huge bumps in these areas, which are lots of donor reads mapped to the same location. Okay, uh, this is not so that, if you see this kind of picture, it's, it's very hard to do any kind of variant calling in this, in this area. So, um, just because, yeah, so the, the only thing you can infer here is that there's too much variation between the donor and the reference in this region to say anything smart about it. Um, this is so. This picture is only showing the situation with some uh, repeats in your centromere region, uh, but in the donor you might have completely novel sequence which is not representing the reference and it doesn't have to be repetitive. Okay. Uh, when you're trying to map it to the reference, that those reads might end up being mapped to like completely wrong uh, things. Okay, but that's uh, that's something you really cannot do anything about, right? Because you're just trying to map to a reference, and you have sequence which is not mapping there, so you you, you don't know what to do. Okay, so there's no magic wand to like solve this novel sequence thing. Like that's uh, that's one thing you have to deal with when you're mapping to the reference. Okay, so that's that's that. Any questions? Uh, if you don't, we are ready to go into the lab. Yeah, one. Sorry. So since people like this figure that we have red and green, we think that uh, all the uh, reads came from the same reason, right? Yeah, yeah. So all these green reads came from the same reason. Can we uh, answer something like duplication or presence of transposome in different sites that have the like same or single, almost single sequence? So, okay, so the question is uh, how does this, if I understand, so how does this picture over here, uh, how is this related to gene duplication? Is, or yeah, kind of, for example, in our bacterial system, uh, if you do random mutation, sometimes what happens is that transposomes same sequence can get inside to the operon of different position. So if I want to identify that the transposon went in the only one operon or in more than one operon. So if I get something like this, should I say that so it's like more than one? Or? So no. So what? So what I was trying to show with the left and the right panels here was that the left panel is much more suspicious of duplication than the right panel. So you might have legitimate copy number variants between a donor and a reference, right? You might have genes duplicated, regions duplicated, 
right? So the, the donor has two copies. There's only one copy in the reference, and because of that, you will see a bump in coverage, right? So that's kind of what the right image is showing. The, the problem with the, the left image is that when you map these fragments, they're not just all mapped to the same region, but they, the exact breakpoint where they're mapped is the exact same, right? So this is why, right, see they're all aligned over here. So that suggests that the fragment during the Illumina sequences that they, can, they, they come from, the fragment is the same. And again, that, that's an inference. It could be, of course, it could be then you take the, the genome DNA, you share it, and you have two copies in the donor, and it so happens that the sonication or whatever produces the exact same fragment with the exact same breakpoints, and you have two copies of that. That's, that's also possible, uh, but it's more likely in this case that if you have the exact same breakpoints, that they come from the same fragment prior to PCR. So that's why we call them duplicates. So again, the difference is that the, the it's it's about the breakpoints here. Like on the on the right, you still have some PCR, probably PCR duplication over here. There's like s several molecules which start on the same thing, but uh, overall the the increase in depth is like much more gradual than this this kind of steep thing. 